What we've experienced, what we're experiencing here this morning, what we'll continue to experience, you can't experience that on the online show. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You, you, reach over. Just, just reach over and put your hand on the person close to you. Just, just touch somebody. See, now, those of you who will watch this online, you didn't get to do that. That's right. <laughs> you missed that. That's right. Come on, right? There, 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 is, there is a benefit to assembling ourselves together. And sometimes it's oppressed, but God never leaves oppressed unrewarded. He does. He never leaves oppressed unrewarded. Right? He never does that. And, and I'm grateful that God has a designated place mm -hmm. with yes, a designated sir. people yes, and a designated time. Come on. Amen. And if you can if you can align yourself with the designations, you get a suddenly. That's it. Y'all remember the day of Pentecost. <laughs> Y'all better do it. Okay, we gotta move on. We gotta move on. Okay. Oh so, yeah, God has a suddenly for you, but there has to be an alignment on your part. Amen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank yeah. you, sir. So this is good. Anyway, anyway, we're, we're having a wonderful time in the Lord, and it's just 11 o'clock. Where you got to be? So relax. Everybody, we're good. And um, I'm grateful. I have some, I have friends. I mean, all of you are my friends. <laughs> I have special friends with, with uh with me today, and it's just a blessing. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. I, I want to introduce to you um, Pastors Joel and Caitlin Pierce. They're from Brockport, and um, I don't know. I think I think we're. I mean, we connected, and we go back years ago, years ago, and uh, uh, last year sometime, Caitlin reached out. And she said, you remember me? And I, I'm reading her message. I'm like, no, I don't remember. <laughs> I don't, I don't remember. I'm sorry, Caitlin, you weren't supposed to hear that. But, um, and, but we reconnected, and, and we, we just have had opportunity to serve and minister together. And, uh, and the Lord is building out our relationship, and I'm grateful for that. I feel like, I, I, I feel like, um, I almost feel like, I almost feel like an adoptive kind of parent, um, but it's not even that. I just, I really feel such a love uh, with them and for them, and I'm grateful because it's only God can do. You know, God God connects you in certain aspects of your relationship is, is by assignment, Amen. right? Now, you can be willful in the presence of the Lord and take it on yourself, but you're going to cry. Sure are. You gotta get your feelings hurt. Wow. It's gotta be by assignment, Amen. right? It's by assignment. A young young pastor years ago, he came and said, "You know, you you, I want you to be my covering." I said, "Well, let's pray about it." And I prayed about it. He came back and I said, "No, I'm sorry, you're not my assignment at this season. I can't. That's your the Lord's let me know. That's not you're not. You know. And that's true." He didn't know how to take it because he didn't understand. And that's just one of those things where you have to be okay with people saying, so okay, you'll understand it better by and by. Even if you don't understand it now, you'll understand it better later. And you just have to you do that. But I really feel, um, well, I just love them. I love them. And I know they love me. Amen. And so they're, they're visiting with us today. I went back there and said, so and they drove in from Brockport. And I said, you know how many churches you drove by to be here? <laughs> I mean, think about it. But um, I'm grateful to them. And I just want them to just stand and say hello or whatever you want to say or do. Can we just bless God for them? I love you guys. Anything you want to say? You good? Just the wave? I'm good for now. Okay. okay. Good. Thanks for having us. I love you guys. Really nice to Madly in love with them. Madly in love with them. I praise God for them. Now, our, our, our speakers on today, I shared with you a little bit about, about um, pastors uh, Sean and, and Stacy Nolte. They're with us from Williamsport, PA. That is the home of the Little League Amen. World Series. And um, it's a madhouse down in that area around the Little League World Series. And... Uh, uh, but I watch it every year on television. So anyway, I'm thrilled to have them with us. They pastor uh, the well, 
there in Williamsport, and I don't even know how long we've known each other, but they are a part of uh, KRI. They're a part of Kingdom Reign. And uh, I, I was sharing with, um, with John, our co-leader, that um, over the next year and a half, I want to bring in every pastor that is involved in KRI. I want to bring them to New Bethel. Amen. And uh, we, we get to love on them. Yes. Right? Amen. And just treat them like the kings and queens that they are. Yes, sir. And um, I, I pray that we've loved on you well enough. I hope so. Yes. It's not over, so we'll, we're not we're not finished. <laughs> so we're going to lump you up in love a little more. Um, but we're grateful to the Lord to have them. They are um, a dynamic duel in the kingdom. There is this, but can I just speak now? And um, I, I get to serve them in KRI. I get to serve them, uh, but they are as dynamic an apostolic prophetic team as you'll ever come across. And um, the, the thing I love about true apostolic and prophetic anointing is you can be in the room with that anointing and, and not even know it. Not even know it. When you're in a room with people and they have to let you know who they are, right. something's wrong. Amen. Okay, you don't have to believe me. Read your Bible. Amen. Something is wrong when, when people have to self-announce. Right. Mm. right. Okay, you'll get it on the right home. Wow. That, that's, not, that's not kingdom. That's flesh. You can be in a room with these people and not know you're sitting with kingdom royalty. Now that can be said for all of us. But when you talk about people who recognize their anointing and know that their anointing is for a specific assignment yes, sir. Yes, sir. and they set their heart and their mind on the assignment and, and know that the anointing is to, is to satisfy the assignment. It's not to make me great. It's to satisfy the assignment. Amen. That's powerful. Amen. That's who they are in the kingdom. And I'm grateful um, that they are here with us. Sean and Stacy. we love you. Now we're going to ask you to just come and just take your liberty. You don't have to be in a hurry. You don't have to do. I preach long, so they're good. They, they, they're, they're, I've already exercised them. Hush, Ann, you laughing too hard. <laughs> This, so they know how to endure. So would you just stretch your hands this way? Well, Father, thank you for your servants. Thank you that you have brought them here to us. You have filled them to overflowing yes, thank you. with a word in season for this house, for this people. Father, thank you that they have yielded themselves to that end. We ask now, Lord Jesus, do what only you can as you move in them and move through them. Holy yes. Spirit, I pray that you would continue to illuminate this room. Yes, Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Yes, Give us hearts to perceive, Lord, your word. Even, even if it's a word that's a far off, it's just, yes. if it's a prophetic word, Lord, help us to lean yes. into yes. it. Yes. Even though we don't understand it, help us to lean in now in Jesus' name. Yes. Set our spirits on edge. Move us to the edge of our seat as you speak to our hearts. Yes. Bless your servants. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's welcome them. Amen. Amen. Hello, everybody. Hello. Good morning. Oh, you guys look good. Yeah. Yeah, we'll share. We we'll share everything. We can share everything. Oh, thank you for having us. This has been wonderful for us. Bill, Tony, we love you guys. I, I wanna, I wanna brag on them. I, you guys have an amazing yes, we do. Pastor yeah. team, yes, we do. An amazing eldership team yeah. here. I, I just, we haven't traveled much, but, but we know from the pastoral perspective when you have people like you, people like this leadership team here, Amen. don't ever take that for granted. Amen. There's something happening here. God is doing something amazing. I want to say thank you. Thank you for worship. You guys have ministered to us, and this is wonderful. Um, so we're just excited. We're excited for what God is going to do. Um, we'll see, see what happens. So it's funny, our first time coming to KRI, it's been maybe just a few years ago. It hasn't been long, and we were, oh, nice. It's our number. 11-11, that's our number. It's time it is right now. <laughs> so Get we, ready. 
we came to a KRI event and we had no, we didn't haven't met anyone previous. We didn't know what we were going into. We kind of felt like Abraham. We were just going a place we knew we were supposed to go, but didn't know why. And it was going to be a weekend long thing, so we were kind of a captive audience. And um, there was some kind of prayer thing before the first event. And so we went in to pray, and we, we were very, we're both can be introverted, so we were a little awkward, and I didn't know, but we sat right next to Pastor Bill, and man, and you don't know this, but you just started to pray, and something, like something just downloaded, and it's interesting, um, the person who founded the church that I grew up in, the church we got married in, and, and had our children dedicated in, he came out of Rochester, but he, he came out of kind of this area, and a lot of things happened. That church split many times. But when I sat next to you, God just began to download all the stuff that he had intended for there to be a well-worn path between New York and Pennsylvania. And I just felt like I was having one of those full circle moments where I was back where, uh, where our church started. They were, they were sent out of this kind of area and and I don't know what God's doing but that's what God's saying to me again and I'm, I'm listening to you guys it's the beautiful thing about the kingdom you feel like family yeah. even though I don't know you Hallelujah. I can already tell oh my gosh my girl will love you my God will love you and I'm, going, I'm already matchmaking <laughs> but it's so good but I do believe that that there, this is this is a trickle that I hope in my heart and I believe God desires a well-worn path. I don't know how. You know, we can't make that happen. He has to make it happen. But we're so excited to be here. And I want to share one other little thing. Do you guys have, do you, did you eat the now and later candies? Yes. So the last couple weeks I've just been praying and I've learned it's better for me to pray for God's presence than it is to prepare all this. It just makes it a lot better. So I'm just praying, God, give us a now word. And what God gave me is, no, we're, I, and this is God to you, This besides us. Like, this is for you, God says, I want you to have a now and later word. <laughs> you ever get one of those words? Like, there's some yeah. words we heard 10, 20 years ago. Amen. We still yep. regurgitate yeah. those words. So right. this isn't Sean and Stacy. This is God. Appreciate God it. wants Thank you to have a now and later word. Thank you. So we, we were off for COVID. We, we came back middle last year, and then we were off over Christmas. Some things happened in Pennsylvania. So we were off until the beginning of March. And when we came back together, man, God has been hammering me with just the dependence thing. What do you depend on? Who do you depend on? And, and Easter, he gave me this message. And I, I feel like we have to preface what we're doing today with this, because if this doesn't happen then we haven't done our jobs and you haven't done yours. Mm -hmm. There's a scripture, Matthew 3, chapter 3, verse 11. This is John the Baptist. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. I say that because, man, that phrase hit me on Easter. He, the one who comes after me. John the Baptist was sent to point people to Jesus. Yeah, amen. He was crazy. He was prophetic. He ate some weird stuff. He dressed in a weird way. He lived in the wilderness. But when he came out, man, he rebuked the religious leaders. He baptized Jesus. But he was quick to say, I'm not him. He comes after me. And I'm not worthy to even untie his shoes. So I want to preface everything with that. If we don't point you to him, we have not done our job. So are you all with me? We're here because of him. Peter said it's by his name and by faith in his name that we do these things. So that's why we're here. Amen? All right, turn in your Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 21, if you would. 1 Chronicles chapter 21. I always have more stuff than I have table room. Now. And now she's hogging it. Yeah. <laughs> First Chronicles 21. We're going to look 
You know what? Why don't you, can you guys stand with us? Just yes. stand. Yeah, we're going to read a couple scriptures and then we're going to pray. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 21. And we're going to look at verses 22 through 24 to start. Are you all there? Good enough? Okay. Just fake it if you're not. That's okay. Just say, yep, yep, I'm there. You're probably in Genesis, but that's all right. Then David said, verse 22, David said to Ornan, Give me the site of this threshing floor, that I may build on it an altar to the Lord. For the full price, everybody say full price. Full price. For the full price you shall give it to me, that the plague may be restrained from the people. Ornan said to David, Take it for yourself, and let my lord the king do what is good in his sight. See, I will give the oxen for burnt offerings, and the threshing, threshing sledges for wood, and the wheat for the grain offering. I will give it all. But King David said to Ornan, No, I will surely buy it for the full price. For I will not take what is yours for the Lord, or offer a burnt offering with that which costs me nothing. Ooh, Why don't we pray again? Father, thank you, God. Lord, I thank you for your presence in this place. Lord, you are here, and we recognize that you are here. God, we, it makes me think, in Zechariah, it says, ask for rain in the day of latter rain. In other words, when it's raining, that's a good time to ask for rain. God, your spirit is poured out in this place. And Father, I ask for more. Do you want more in this place? Do you want more? Lift up your voice. Say, God, I want more of you to come into this place. I want more of you, God. More of you, Father. Yes, Lord. Lord, help us to have the same, the same posture that our sister did when she said, I have to get my life right. I have to get back in church. Lord, we are here because we are desperate for you. And Father, we will glorify you at the end of this. We will lift you up. We will give you all the glory because it's due your name. So bless this word, God. Lord, do what you want us to do. If you want us to shift gears, whatever you want to do, Holy Spirit, we give you full authority. Just bless us. Touch our hearts, God. Let us walk out of here different than how we walked in. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You be seated. So this is an interesting phenomenon when my wife and I get together because we... We, we play off each other, which in a good way, in a good way, not a bad way. We're not going to start getting a little tiff up here or anything like that. But we do get on each other's nerves. That may come out. I know that we love each other and we're not going anywhere. It's good because she functions prophetically and it, it, I'm not a prophet. I, I, I get words. We all can prophesy. That's what the Bible says. But I... I, I Hopefully, this will give you some hope in some of the things that you do because I can ride her coattails quite often. She gets in this mode, and I'm like, it's like God starts to suck me into this place that I've never been in. You know what I mean? Yes. I mean, that was happening during testimony time. You guys are all testifying. You know, Revelation, it's the testimony of Jesus as the spirit of prophecy. If he's did it, done it for you, he can do it for me too. It elevates the truth. So I love preaching with my wife because it elevates. It makes me look better than what I look. So, so I'm excited. I'm excited to share the podium with her. She's awesome. So let me just say this quickly. I often pray a date. It's a very dangerous prayer. And it's this. It's God, I want more of you at any cost. And, and just listen. That, that's a great prayer and that's a really bad prayer. Because you don't know what you're asking for when you pray for that. And the unfortunate part, which is the good part about that, God knows what you need to have more of him at any cost. God knows what to add in and what to take away. And God knows the price that you need to pay to get there. If you are tight on this and you're taking notes, we're going to call it, you get what you pay for. You get what you pay for. <laughs> I'm, stealing, I'm stealing this, okay? I'm going to get what you pay for. Put that out there. You can take all of it, that's fine. Before we get in, back into Chronicles, we're going to go through that. Uh, Matthew seven fourteen says, Narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And this is the unfortunate, sad part. There are few who find it. Yeah. There are few. 
and it's funny, I, I'm a word nerd, and I'm, I'm gonna, I, I know it takes up a lot of time, whatever, but we have, sometimes when you're, when you're reading scripture, you really have to understand what the words mean, because if you do, you will get the fullness of the scripture. Yes. You will not just have something that you can quote or memorize and quote back to somebody. You get it. But the word narrow means to make firm, fixed, or established. Mm. So when you walk down this narrow way, it is, it is establishing you. It is fixing you. It is making yes. you firm. The narrow way, right? Yeah. Does anybody get claustrophobic when they get in really yes. tight spaces? Yes. I'm not a fan of tight spaces. Guess what? God puts us in tight spaces, and that's what makes us established. Yes. Difficult means troubling or compressed. So really what it's saying is, you're becoming fixed as you walk through the gate and go through troubling, compressed. It even means to press as grapes. You know how the, they used to press the grapes? Yes. When you do that, yes. that, is, that is promoting you and bringing you up to new levels. <laughs> but the unfortunate thing is, it says there's few who find it. Yes. Few. And that's a, that's a sad commentary. Martin Luther said, a religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing wow. is worth nothing. That's right. That's good. A religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is worth nothing. Listen, this is, this is a big thing for me. We tell our church all the time. You're going to go through hell. Amen. You are. Jesus said it's impossible that offenses and persecutions won't come. You will go through hell. The tragedy I found in our sphere of influence is that oftentimes people don't get everything they need out of those hellish circumstances. Get it. They do it again. You go, you go around the mountain because you don't get what you were supposed to get when you went through it. That's part of you get what you pay for when you pay the full cost. And you're willing to lean in. And you're willing to pull all of those nutrients out of the soil of that hell. Then you, you haven't arrived. But just like a video game that you play, you've, you've leveled up. <laughs> Does that make sense? You have more weapons in your arsenal, and you have more things that you can do. And you're more confident in Him. And another thing, it doesn't give you history with Him. You know how important history is? Yes, sir. Because when you have history, God has done something so crazy in your life. And He's come through for you time and time and time again. When you come through a hellish situation, He may not even give you a specific word. But because you know His nature, yes, sir. because you know how He's dealt with you in the past, yes. you can confidently say, I got this. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, God. The, the cool thing is that the straights and the narrow way, they were actually designed to give you hope. That's what they're there for. The etymology of hope is tribulation, perseverance, wow. character, wow. hope. And when you're in the tribulation, it's disappointing. When you're in the, the perseverance, it's disappointing. When he's building the character, it's disappointing. Yeah. But if you will tarry through that process and get to the hope, the hope does not disappoint. But that's the purpose of the straits. It's not to torture you. The narrow way is not to bind you. The narrow way is to push you to that place of hope that doesn't disappoint. It's good. I think in many ways we've shifted as a church to God, don't let me go through hell. Yeah. When that's going to happen. It is going to happen. Yeah, it I mean, it, it's like when you let your your infant, they, they're not sleeping. What do you let them? You let them cry themselves to sleep. Yeah. We're a bunch of infants. They've got sitting up there and say, <laughs> sorry, you're going to have to whine a little bit to get through this one. Yeah. Wow. But it's healthy and it's how we learn. Jesus learned obedience wow. through suffering. Yes, he did. Oh, my God. So listen, we, we can't skirt around these things anymore. We gotta face them. And we gotta get everything that God wants us to have out of these situations. Amen? Okay, she keeps looking at me. I thought she was taking the mic. We don't tell each other where we're going either. So this is like you know, a package we unopen and you won't unopen. It's fun to watch. It's fun to watch. Some of it might be a sweater like your grand baby you never wore all the time. But most of it's okay. I do have to say, this is a peculiar thing God does, though. Like, I want things polished in my life, and that's not how God lets us do it. No, no, never. 
He just doesn't. I, I, I'm here, like I got my handwritten stuff. I wanted to type this out. God's like, I don't want it typed. I don't want it polished. I don't. But that is why we don't tell each other where we're going because it forces us. We know, we know the general. Yeah. But it forces us to be in line with the Holy Spirit yeah, so that we're really not, hard. like, this is hard. <laughs> it's hard, but God has told us to do it because it produces a fruit in us out of the uncomfortability of it. We sharpen each other. We both have to be in tune with the Holy Spirit. So that's, that's what it is. <laughs> Amen. So are you still in First Chronicles 21? Yes. So let me just mention, we're not going to turn there, but I'm going to refer to it from both perspectives. These stories are also in the end of 2 Samuel. So much like the story you read in the Gospels, you've got different perspectives of the same thing. So I'm going to say a couple things that you might find, not find in Chronicles, but they are there. They're in the midst of the story. But the context is that this is at the end of David's life. And if you read in 2 Samuel, it, it actually it says it also in 1 Chronicles right before it, he had just defeated... And his army had just defeated the last of the giants in the land. They're all gone. I, all of his enemies are gone. Are you with me? Yes, sir. They're all gone. So he has rest. He's not fighting anybody. And he, in 2 Samuel, he does this big, long, last David's last song. Yeah. And he says a couple things there. Like, God, you've been with me, and you brought me through this, and you defeated my enemies. enemies. And he also says, you brought me out to a spacious place. Yes. Yes. That's a crazy statement because this is the guy who ran from Saul in hidden caves and yeah. never really had a permanent place of his own in the beginning of his life. He said, you brought me out to a spacious That's place. That's the narrow straits. Exactly. He's finally in the whole part. It's the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. It's the back of the wardrobe. You open it up and there's this huge land, this spacious place. But be, it, he goes from that. So he, would you say that through that context, he's in a relatively good place? Yeah, He's satisfied, would you think? He, he's finally in his full kingship. That took quite a long time, didn't it? Three anointings in different kingdoms. But he's finally in a place where he's supposed to be. And then in the midst of all of that, he gets tripped up in First Chronicles 21. And he calls for a census. It, it's funny. Her and I both have our idea of why he did this. If you read uh, commentators and theologians, no one can really agree with why he did this. Right. Yeah. And if you look, First Chronicles said that Satan, verse 20, 21, verse 1, yes. Satan stood up against Israel and moved David. That's right. In Samuel, it says the Lord stood up and moved David. Mm -hmm. So which was it? <laughs> Both. Because God knew. And that's what we're going to get to, and that's really the gist of this message. God knows the things that hinder us. Wow. He knows the things that hold us back, that prevent us from going into our full potential. It, second, uh, I'm going to jump ahead quickly, but 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful. God has revolutionized that scripture for me over the years. Do you know when you go through hell, that is God being faithful? Yes. That's his faithfulness. If you don't understand, because all want, we all want to ascribe that to the devil. Oh, the enemy made me do it, or I'm going through hell because of the devil. No, you're going through hell because God said, I don't want you to hold that baggage anymore. I don't want you to be in that bondage anymore. That's why you're going through hell. And that's the process of faithfulness. Because when you're faithless, and you're like, the devil made me do it, and I can't get through this, and why, God, I tithe, I serve, I'm, I'm good to my husband, I'm good to my wife, I love my kids, I said this, but, you know, I, I repented for that, but all that stuff. And then in, in, in the midst of it, we're like, God, why are we going through this? And God's like, just, you got to push. you got to ride it out. Because I'm pulling out of you. The thing that's refusing to allow you to go forward. So at the end of David's life, the census that he called, whether we get specific about it or not, this was something the Lord was wanting to pull out of his life that took his entire life to get it out of him. That's amazing. But it's the faithfulness of the Lord. He wants us to be free. You know, it's the faithfulness of God to bring us into situations that are designed in Jeremiah. It says we root out, we pluck up, and we destroy. Sometimes it feels like that. God wants to pull all that stuff out. But know he's good, and know he's faithful, and he wants it for your good and for your better. Are you going to talk more about the census? You go ahead. 
So yeah, so David takes the census and he's counting all of the people in the army. He even counts the the Levites and the Benjamites who are not supposed to be counted. But that's the sin that causes God gives him like three choices of the penalty for the sin. But I just wanted to share kind of a personal story of we all tend to take our own census <laughs> from time to time. And I, I so for me, we, again, we're slightly different on our opinion, but I think David's failure there was that he didn't trust God. Even after all of the exploits, he, I don't think he trusted God, so he wanted to know for himself, how many people do I have in the army? And, and in Exodus 30, 12, God told Moses, when you take a census of the children of Israel for their number, then every man shall give a ransom for himself to the Lord, that there be no plague among them. So each, each person who's listed, there has to be a ransom. There has to be an atonement for that person. So David set these people up. Like, he wasn't viewing them as God's people that God would make atonement for. He was listing them as his own people because, in my opinion, I believe he wanted that security of the numbers. (sighs) The security of the numbers. Do we have any numbers? I am a numbers people. I am a budget person. I am so... When Sean and I, so we didn't grow up being pastors. We've not done this a long time, actually. We both had other things we did for many years, which I like. We're very much lay pastors. That's just how we roll. We grew up serving other pastors, and we delighted in doing that. But when God called us to start a church, we were older. It was awkward. We didn't have some of the support that we were looking for. But one of the things God had us do... um, so we we had this we had bought this big house at auction. It was a beautiful house. We had bought and sold many houses to get to this big house. Well, when we finally so we had to quit our full time positions, and this was of course over several years. But God and we had a word years before that you're going to both quit employment and go into full time ministry. And at this stage in our life, we're like, that's never going to happen. <laughs> like we, had, we had just served a long time. We just didn't see it. But God opened door after door. And so we sold the big house to posture ourselves. We were able, it took two years. It was a nightmare. I'm leaving a lot of details out for the sake of time. But we were able to pay cash then for a fixer-upper after selling this. Again, worked many years to get to this point. We sold the thing we loved to to go into ministry so that we could work and do both and not make the same amount of money to pay the mortgage. So God did all these wonderful things. So fantastic like we got out of debt if you've not done that like that was a complete game changer to, like our lives are very different from getting out of debt but in that process so here's i can't see you guys very well so here's my numbers census self we're out of debt like god's done one of the largest exploits he's ever done for us and i'm not going to tell this story either but we had a twenty thousand square foot lovely building donated to our 10, 12 adult strong congregation. (laughs) But God was doing extraordinary things. And so, but I started, I'm not not gonna lie, I started freaking out. I'm like, oh my gosh, how are we gonna do this? How, like, it's just the weight of that. And well, I knew it was Jesus, but I let it fall on me. So we're out of debt. God has shown himself with signs and wonders. We are at a high point. And here comes Stacy Nolte trying to budget everything. So I looked after we sold our house and we had a fixer up where we had a certain amount left. Didn't I go like a psycho on that budget? And I start lining. We need this for this. We need that for this. We need that. And I'm... Like line by line going down the thing, and I like I'm having a full blown panic attack over over this stuff. And in my history, is I came from a house where we didn't have a lot, so I've I've 
waged a war on poverty. Like I've spent my life defeating that particular spirit. So here I am back in a poverty mindset at the best point in my life so far. And I'm line by line in it. And, and Jesus like, <laughs> sometimes he's like, oh. And he just grabbed me and he's like, Stace, you left me out of the budget. You left me out of the budget. And I'll tell you on paper, that budget didn't work, but God, I, I knew that was wrong. I felt like David that day. I felt like David that day. I had figured it all out. I had eaten from the tree of the, of the knowledge of good and evil. But the tree of life, like, I, I just set it aside. So what I did, I ripped up that budget, and it, it was phenomenal. We, we ended up going... For years, we wanted to take our kids to Disney. We went to Disney that year. We renovated our house that year. I, okay, for those of you who, are, who might be like me, I got the sofa I wanted that year. I got the nice sofa, the upgraded carpet. Like, I went back and forth. Like, I'd never spent that kind of money on a sofa before. But... You know our savings stayed put. When I added God to the budget, I didn't know how. Thank you. But in His economy, all things really are possible. And so, I, to me, that that's the census. That's David trying to line by line it, trying to figure it out. He's at the high point in his career, and he still doesn't trust God. And God told me, and we're pastors at that point. And God told me, you, on your best day, you might trust me at 80%. And I was like, oh! <laughs> I was mortified, but it was true. And so God has taken us on this journey. And we have been through hell the last couple years, but I trust him. And the last two years has been way better, even with all the hell. But God is testing us. So that's my sense. Can I just tell you, too, that you know what makes that, it's not a formula. We all want formulas, but if, if there is something that makes that formula work, we have stumbled into everything that God has allowed in our lives. Literally, like, yes. like we, I don't, we were ignorant. We had no idea what was happening, and then all of a sudden it unfolded. Yes. But we've, we've tried to become people, and, and this will be the most theological thing I say today. <laughs> We've tried to become people that are just stupid enough to yes. believe that God will do what he says he's going to do. Yes. 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 Listen, we've had to. We don't have the education. We don't have the pedigree. We, don't, we, don't, we haven't had the resources. We haven't had the jobs to support lifestyles. We haven't had any of that. Yet we're in a place now where we got Jesus For what we're talking about. Right. We can't give you a five second story and, and bring all the 15 years of the stuff we're up there. Because people look at you and they're like, oh, well, it must be nice. Right. No, it wasn't nice. Right. Not one bit of it was nice. Right. And, and, it, and it wasn't all like, I didn't look at Jesus like the holding the lamb with the halo right. over his head in that. Right. I looked at him as someone who hated me and right. didn't want to bless me. So it was a back and forth. I trusted him and believed in him. Right. And just, yeah. you know, we, when God, God opened a door, we walked work. through the door. If he opened another door, we keep walking. If he yeah. shut it, well, there you go. I guess we're not doing that anymore. Yeah. Stop trying to kick open doors that got yeah. shut. Yeah. You're going to drive yourself crazy. Preach, <laughs> Preach, I think, too, and I am in full agreement with her. We were talking a little bit about this this morning, but... I think fear was the root it is. of what brought David to that decision. Yes. So he calls the census. He wants to survey all of his resources. And it makes sense though, doesn't it? We do it. He's the captain of the army. Yeah. He's the king of the yeah. kingdom. He wants to know what he's got and what he can face and what he can go up against. But what I find fascinating is no matter how good you are at defeating the enemies you have on the outside... You are still going to have to face the enemies that you have on the inside. Amen. And that's what happened with him. When he, re when he surveyed those resources, 
God is like, yep, you got people, you got weapons, you got money, but you know what you don't have? Trust. You don't trust me. Right. And you you have this, he had this innate ability, and, and I can hit some of those points, but he, he struggled in relationships. Yeah. I mean, he was the yeah. eighth son of Jesse. Yeah. He was put out in the field to pasture the, to pasture the sheep. And because nobody else wanted to do it, and he was the youngest. Samuel comes to anoint him, and they forgot that they had an eighth kid. That's right. Yeah. That's Samuel right. tries to anoint at the word of the Lord the, to anoint the next king, and he's like, "Wait a minute, this isn't working. Is there somebody else?" And Jesse's like, "Oh, well, yeah. I got, there's a guy, a kid. I think he's my kid. He's out in the field." <laughs> You laugh at that, but there's some there's some evidence that David could be an illegitimate son. I don't want to get into that one more time. But he I just drop a bomb. You guys go and look at that for yourself. But this kid, I feel like David because he had no training, no mentoring, no grooming. All it was was a call. A word of the Lord spoken over him. And he was dumb enough to believe that God could do it. Even from where he came from. But I'm telling you, he had a huge problem with relationships. And don't we know, we always struggle with what we don't have. Right? And, and that's what God, if you, we talk to people sometimes, like, I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't, I don't know what the issue is. Sometimes we spend so much time trying to get to the bottom of what our issue is, when all you have to do is look at your behavior. Right. What you're doing wrong will indicate what the lack is. That's right. And that's what happened with David. He struggled with relationship, and it's all throughout Scripture. He was disconnected from his father. He, be, he became this worshiper, not because... It, this may be blasphemous, but I don't fully think it was because he was totally in love with God. I think everybody hated him so much that he wanted to go out in the field and be by himself. That's what made him such a radical worshiper, because the only person he could trust was God. But he goes out and he tries to give lunch to his brother, yep. and his brother rejects him. Yep. Saul rejects him. Yep. Saul tries to fill this fatherly role, yep. and then goes crazy and yep. starts throwing spears at him. Yep. Somebody say relationship problems, right? <laughs> he had a problem with people. Every relationship he got in was dysfunctional. You preach it, man. Even when he when he when he killed Goliath, he got to marry Saul's wife Michael. She despised him. Because he worshipped the Lord. His son betrayed him and tried to take the kingdom. His other son raped his daughter. Like there were issues throughout his entire reign in the kingdom. And he was the man after God's own heart. So don't tell me that you're disqualified. There's nothing you can do. Read the stories of David and the story of Job and then come back to me and tell me how bad your life is. Come on. That's good. But he struggled with this stuff. But this became his price. What he went through, his struggles, all of these nuances and things that he went through, it became the price he had to pay to be anointed and to be who God called him to be. Isn't that crazy? It is. So, I think that this is what was happening. God was weaning David's mind and heart from craving people. Because he constantly went back to wanting the approval and the That's accolades of people. Don't we do that? Yes. No matter how much we trust God, no matter how much we love Him, we always want our whoever to tell us that we did a good job. But what happens with that is that when we start to put our dependence on them and our trust in them, it distorts our relationship with God. And as you go higher or lower in God, however you want to view that, you will face these things at a concentrated level. New levels, new devils. That's what we always say, right? But God, is, he's faithful and he wants to pull those stuff out, that stuff out of you. No. I want to say this before I hand this off to her. God wants to destroy all of your enemies. Not just some of them. Do you remember, I think it's 1 Corinthians 15, where it says the last enemy is death? You know, Jesus wasn't done just when he was crucified and put on the cross. It was finished when death was conquered. Amen. When the last enemy was conquered, that parallels our lives. 
See, if you think about the promised land, they refused to drive out all their enemies. So they lived in their inheritance, in their promised land, with the enemy always there. The enemy always squatting, always taking up residence in their land that belonged to them. And the enemy will do that to you. And that's why when Jesus comes into your life, he is not, I think it's in Deuteronomy, he says, I brought them out to bring them in. He didn't just bring you out of bondage so you can wander around and just be this guy that says, oh, thank you, Jesus, I'm no longer making bricks anymore. He brought you out to bring you in to say, listen, he can, he can take care of this bondage. He can heal you. He can deliver you. He can save you. He can take that anger from you. He can take all of those things out of your life and set you in a place where you can be healthy. Yes, sir. Do you know we settle for that stuff? Oh, mom's always been angry like that. Or, or, oh, that's the way he is. Or, that's the way she is. Those are the things. That was David's thing that God, David was always like that. He always had a problem with people. He always depended on them when he should have been depending on God. And that's what God was trying to pluck out. Okay. I, uh, let me say this. It's amazing what God allows in one stage of your life, but he will not allow it in another one. And you know why that is? Because you're too mature now. You've come too far for those little elementary childish things that we struggle with. That, that when you get a little bit of pressure and you get a little bit of stress, you go back fishing like Peter did. You go back and do what you always did because it's familiar. Those are the things he's trying to pull out. It's not okay anymore. It's just not. It's not me. It's scripture. So listen, stop depending on people. Depend on God. Amen? Depend on God. Because if we don't, I, and listen, for God's sake, don't depend on people like me and her. Like we, we can help you guys. I, I tell our church this all the time. I've had experiences. I have a little bit of wisdom. I understand the Bible a little bit. I can give you tools. I can give you help. I can give you counsel. But I can't change you. I can't fix you. The one who comes after. That, he is the one who So we point. We point, but we can't fix. Amen? So... I know we, I told you to be in first, first Chronicles 21. Look at the scripture, if you will. I want to read a couple things. So verse 11 through 13. And do you guys know he did the census, and then it ended up backfiring. He sends a prophet, and he sends this angel to start destroying the people. And, and what happens, David realizes he sins, and the prophet, by the word of God, gives him three choices for punishment. And in verse 11, I'll, I'll just read this very quickly. It says, so Gad, I always love that, the prophet of Gad. It's like you're saying God when you're in like Boston or something. Gad. <laughs> Sorry, that was a point of joke. So Gad came to David and said to him, thus says the Lord, take for yourself either three years of famine or three months to be swept away before your foes, while the sword of your enemies overtakes you, or else three days of the sword of the Lord, even pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Now, therefore, consider what answer I shall return to him who sent me. So here's David's answer. David said, yeah, I'm in great distress. Please let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are very great. But do not let me fall into the hand of men. So he's starting to get it. He's starting to get it, but he's still got a person issue. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You're... I know, God, I screwed up. I know there's consequences, but don't let me go out before these people right. and be embarrassed. Do you know that's what Saul did? He did the same right. thing. He did the same thing. He said, Samuel, come out with me so it looks like I'm still worshiping the Lord. So the people see that. But So he's still dependent. He was messed up and dysfunctional, but listen, one thing I love about David, and we can take this away from his whole life, David knew how to repent. Yes, he, he knew how to turn yes, back to did. God. It didn't matter what he did. No. He was a murderer. Yeah. He was an adulterer. He yeah. was this and that. He probably screwed things up, I would say, more than most people did. Maybe more than anybody. <laughs> Yet he was called a man after God's own heart. Right. So God was trying to change him. So look at verses 22 through 24. And I, I think this is what she wants to end with too. So 
So this is what happens. He, the, the, you guys, I think you know the story, but the angel starts to destroy the people, and then David realizes that, oh, I shouldn't have chose that, so how do I fix it? And, and then, so the prophet comes back. Let's read verse 18. The angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So David went up at the word of Gad, which he spoke in the name of the Lord. Ornan turned back and saw the angel. His four sons hid themselves, and Ornan was still threshing wheat. So David comes to Ornan. Ornan looks and saw David, went out from the threshing floor, and prostrated himself before David with his face to the ground. Now this is the part. So David says to Ornan, Give me the site of this threshing floor that I may build on it an altar to the Lord for the full price. You shall give it to me. Now listen, he had understood what he did wrong. He had understood what God was trying to pull out. So he knew when he goes into the presence of Ornan that he cannot accept. Right. See, listen. Ornan was doing something noble. David was the king. Right. He's in the presence of the king and he's like, listen, you can have the sacrifice. Right. You can have the field. Right. You can have the threshing floor. Do whatever you got to do to make things right and I'll provide everything for right. you. Yeah. Do you know we do that in the church? We come in on a Sunday morning and we say, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me, but I don't want to do anything. That's right. It's not just here. Right? It happens everywhere. It happens in Williamsburg too, amazingly enough. But we can't, we have to understand. There are times where maybe we're so despondent or something bad is happening so bad that we come in and we relax and we get fed. But that is not an every time thing. That every joint is supposed to supply. We're supposed yes, to supply. Sir. We're supposed to be producers, yes, not consumers. Come and David on. understood that. I can't take your sacrifice wow. and put it in front of my God wow. and have that pay the price. Wow. There are some things that we go through. You, It's not discounted. You can't pull it off the rack. You can't go to a thrift shop. You can't go to a yard sale. There's some things in your life. And you won't like it. You won't want to do it. I don't want to do it. Ever. 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 That is a true statement. I will do it. But I don't ever want to do it. Right. But we can't. Our, our society is so, we want things so quick, we want things so cheap, we want things so easy. God does not work that way. And you will learn anything of lasting value that comes into your life. You will have to pay full price for it. I told this to our, our prayer group on Wednesday, like, like two Wednesdays ago. I was reading the, through this, and I felt like we've been through hell, people. We've had, we've had what, six cancer diagnoses. Four of them have died. Her dad was one of them. We, we've gone from thing to thing to thing. We had a woman who ended up in prison. There, there's just all this stuff that's happening. Relationships breaking up, all of that. But I, I'm looking around the room at all these people, and... I'm going to throw another scripture out there because I love it. There's a scripture, I think it's in Jeremiah 29. It says, the Lord is with you like a dread champion. Wow. And I, I look at all of these people and I picture Jesus standing there with these tattered robes and, and, and this weapon in his hand. Like he just fought a battle for them. But then they're standing in with him in these tattered clothes because they've been through hell. Wow. But these people, I read through this and I felt like God was saying, listen, these people have paid full price. And because they, listen to this, catch this, because they paid full price, their sacrifices from here on out mean more. When, when we got out of debt, God spoke to me one day and said, listen, your offering now goes further. Now listen, that's not kind to listen to me, it's biblical. Because the borrower is no longer servant of the land. So there's not, there's not a portion of my that I owe to anybody in such a way that it hangs over my head. So when I give, my dollar means more than the dollar of the one who's who's in tremendous debt. I, it makes no sense to me, but I'm telling you, God told me, and I believe that. And I think this is the same principle. When you've gone through hell and you pay the full price for God to stay his hand, because that's what he did. Yeah. Your, your next price, your next thing you lean into, will mean more than the last thing did. Isn't that amazing? Yes. So let me just finish that so I can hand this over to her. He says, 
Verse 23, Orn said to David, Take it for yourself, and let my lord the king do what is good in his sight. See, I will give the oxen for burnt offering, and the threshing sledges for wood, and the wheat for the grain offering. I will give it all. But David said to Ornan, No, but I will surely buy it for the full price. For I will not take what is yours, or offer a burnt offering which costs me nothing. Listen, you know the things that God is trying to pluck out of you. Yeah, yeah. And unfortunately for all of us, God is not tricked. <laughs> right. Right. He's not. I asked who was Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah. God doesn't get tricked. You can't withhold some of it when he's requiring all of it. Come on, man. So I want to encourage you today. I, I believe many of you because I think we're always at a precipice like that. Because God is so faithful. So pay the full price. Mm-hmm. It'll hurt. It'll squeeze. It'll be ouchy. But it'll be worth it. Yes. 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 So keep in mind with David, let me jump around a little. So David all this time was looking for a place to build a home for his Jehovah. The whole time he's looking for a place. Mm-hmm. Psalms 132 3 says, Surely I will not go into the chamber of my house or go up to the comfort of my bed. I will not give sleep to the to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord. So in the midst of all this, David had been looking for that place to build a temple, that place for the Lord to lay his head. That was David's heart. Little did he know that would be the threshing floor place. But I, I want to talk a second about the threshing floor. So the threshing, it's... It was a smooth, open, round area, like a flat surface. And there'd be donkeys that would come around and they would drag this heavy threshing board, but it would tear away the grain from the stalks. Like it would take kind of the fruit away from the dross, if you will. But the threshing floor, it's a place of treading. Remember the scripture, wherever your feet tread, I will give to you. That's kind of the process we've been in, and probably some of you, where you go to that threshing floor, where you've made the mistake, and now God's letting you feel the weight of the mistake, not to crush you, to destroy you, but to crush you, to give you that hope, and to to cause you to put your reliance on him. But that place of treading, that ends up being the inheritance that he gives you, that place of the threshing floor. It's a place where you're sifted. It's a place where you're sorted. Like even remember the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. The wilderness is the threshing floor. When we go to the wilderness, we don't want to think that the Spirit led us there. And didn't it say David was led there by the Lord? It says he was led there by Satan. But in Isaiah, I think it's 54, he says... That I create the destroyer. I create the spoiler. But no weapon that's coming against you will prosper. He allows the spoiling. He allows the destroyer for a moment. But it's because he's trying to get at your heart. He's trying to get your devotion. But that is the place of the threshing floor. It's the place of tribulation. You guys know Job, too. He said, though you slay me, I will trust you. Some translations say, I will hope in you. Remember that? Tribulation, perseverance, character, hope. And Job said, when you try me, I'm coming out as gold. And and Sean was just saying, if you're going around this mountain, like, pick up the nutrients. Don't... (laughs) Don't stop. (laughs) Yes, like, and remember the Israelites, they saw themselves as locusts to be devoured. But then there was John the Baptist, and he said, I'm going to eat the locusts. And we've we've come to this place where when the trial and the tribulation comes, there's, even though we don't like it, I'm like, bring it on. Like, when he starts preparing that table for you in the presence of your enemy, yes. and I know my enemies, when poverty comes to the table, when anxiety comes to the yeah. table, yeah. when they all start yeah. bringing in, that used to terrify me like this, this speaking. 
I used to be tormented at the thought of speaking. And only in church. I, I had a job where I spoke in front of lots of people all the time. Never terrified me, but this did. But I tell you, now, when those enemies show up, I'm like, it's time to eat. It's time to eat. It's not a time to be scared. It's time to. It's time for nutrients. It's time to eat the locusts. It's time to eat the wild honey. It's time to go in the promised land where the big grapes are. You know, the wilderness doesn't have any enemies. The promised land is full of enemies. We're called to drive them out. If you don't got any enemies, you're not in the promised land. But that was the threshing floor. That was that place of being sifted. And you get sifted long enough. When the sifting comes, you're like, <laughs> like it, it does. Something changes in you. And even though you don't like it, it like it's like it drives you into that extra gear. I, and I can't explain that. And he, he talked about the cancer thing. So we just shared this with these guys last night. A few, well, it's been a couple years ago. We had one person with cancer, and they were on sabbatical from doing missionary work. They did mission stuff for 15 years. This family was in, and she got cancer, and they ended up stateside. They couldn't. They're from Romania. They couldn't go back to Romania. They just had to stay here. And God began to give us a word that we were going to be a cancer center. And so at the word of the Lord, don't we jump up and down, and we're hooting and hollering. We're like, we're going to be a cancer center. We're like, yeah, we got feels. We're all excited and, and he just told you within two well within 14 months we had six diagnoses of cancer four of them were stage four like right out of the gate and, and like four of our people in the last two years have passed and one of them was my father but I tell you like and I I hope that our desire is to, to give what God is doing for us, to give it to you. And so I'm just praying, Jesus, even if we can't articulate it, let them get it by spirit. Yeah. But the last two, they were a mother and daughter. And the, the daughter had young kids of her own. And this is a family, like, I love them. I grew up with them. Like, Jamie, the daughter, I've been to Trinidad with her. I've been to Romania with her. Like, I slept in a bed with her. And we lost them both two weeks from each other in January. And this, you know, we had lost two others just the year before. It's been, it's been a, a hard season, and there's been COVID. We lost someone to COVID. Like, there's, there's just been, a, we've been in a mess. And we're talking about 50 people. Like, we're talking like 10% of our congregation. And it's a mess, but there is an unusual presence Amen. on our people right now. It has kicked everything into priority. It has caused us to say, you know what? Like this pedestal BS, this kiss the rain stuff, like it doesn't Amen. work for us. Amen. It doesn't work Amen. for us. We don't like it. <laughs> but cancer and death and destruction and COVID, we've all been in COVID together. Yeah. That has sorted out it's what the ass. priorities it are. And we have seen like the, the the two who were who passed from the same family in January, like they had all they had a bunch of kids and their youngest son, he came back, like he's been he's been a mess. He's been out in the fray and he came back and he is serving in our house. He's playing drums when the doors are open. He is in the building and we know him well. We know his gifts, we know his strength, and he's a pastor. My God, he's a pastor, but what a gift. Like, God is transforming people yes. immediately. Yes. Now we know that suddenly. Oh, it came from the years of struggle. God takes a long time to do a suddenly. He does. Remember yes. that. Yes. That's right. Yes. But the threshing floor, like we've been trodden down, we've been beaten, we've been pressed, but not crushed, yes. not destroyed. Yes. And I tell you that, the fruit is coming out. The fruit is coming out. The threshing is what, like that's where you, you figure out who is the wheat and who is the tares. You figure out who's for real and who's not for real. When that trial and testing comes, you do figure out who's got the gold. And I tell you, the gold is not what glitters on the outside. The gold is in here. The gold is what you paid. 
It costs you everything. Amen. It costs you everything. But that's the threshing floor. So get this. That's Mount Moriah. That's, that's where all this stuff happened. That's the place where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. Mm -hmm. That is the place where David bought Ornan's field. That's the place where Solomon ends up building the temple. Yeah. In the threshing field. Yeah. That's where Solomon and David's temple is like open air. It's open to everyone. Like Solomon's temple, it's different than the protocol. It's different than the pedestal. It's open to everyone. That was built at the threshing floor. And then you know what else happened? In that same place, Golgotha. It's the same place where Jesus hung on the cross. David's threshing floor, his moment of weakness. But how good is Jesus? I can't read my notes. Well, I've got, I don't got my glasses on, but... <laughs> Isn't it? It's peculiar. So the place where we meet God, the place where the temple is established, is not the place, it's the place of the ordinary, not the place of the pedestal. It's the place of humility. It's not the place of pride. And it's the place of weakness. It's not the place of strength. So I want to encourage you today, if you feel weak, if you feel downtrodden, like, you're a great candidate. <laughs> You're in a good place to be part of building the temple. Of, and we are the temple. But that's the good news is that he builds the temple where we are crushed and where we are broken and, and where things are difficult. But I love that. So that's where David, he buys the field in penalty to his sin. And that's where the temple is erected. And ultimately, that's where Jesus pays the final Price for all of our sins. Wow. Threshing. <laughs> so there's one other scripture that I just want to share. This is First Kings. First Kings 21. If you want to turn there real quick. And I kind of didn't want to add this, but I just felt like God wanted me to. So I'm gonna. We'll see where it goes. You guys remember. Ahab and Jezebel. <laughs> They're like the, the ultimate bad guys in scripture. So this is the scripture where Ahab decides he wants Naboth's vineyard. Do you remember that? And I'm not going to get into the whole story. There's just a piece of it that God's been highlighting. And it, I felt like this was for you. So starting in 1 Kings 21. You know what? I'm going to look at a different translation. Luckily, I took a picture of it. Okay. <laughs> Starting in verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, next to the place of Ahab, king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard, that I might have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near, next to my house. And for it, I will give you a vineyard better than it. So how, this is, again, going back to paying full price. This is the, that temptation. I'll give you something better if you'll give me what's yours. Or if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth and money. And this price word is actually the same word in the scripture that we were just reading for, for full price. But Naboth said to Ahab, and I love this, and that I've used this in so many different contexts, the Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. So I just wanted to point out Naboth, the word. His name means to increase, bring forth, bear fruit, or flourish. In Jezreel, where he was from, it means God will sow and conceive in strength. So basically it's like that thing that I can bear fruit for because God sowed into me with his strength. That's the thing that we need to forbid the enemy from coming in to take. And there's, I think I wrote it down to you. There's a scripture, well, I'll just tell you, that it was part of the Levitical law. Leviticus 25, 23. The land shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine. For you are strangers and sojourners with me. 
So I love this story about Naboth. He understood that his inheritance belonged to the Lord. It wasn't his to sell. It wasn't his to give away. It wasn't, you don't, you can't pimp out the gospel. You just can't. It's not to be bought or sold. You don't get to just sleep around with it and get the benefits and not understand the ways of the Lord. But I love that about Naboth. He understood because of his father and that inheritance that God has conceived this in me and God has given this to me and he has forbid me from selling it or giving it out to anyone else because it, be- it belonged to him, because it belonged to God. But and if the awesome thing, so Naboth does not, this does not end well for Naboth. They end up stoning him and taking the land anyway. And we all, the cool thing though, the whole, see, sometimes we want our stuff on this side of eternity and God has changed my paradigm. I'm, at, I'm old enough now where I don't care if I see it on this side. Amen. I don't care. Amen. If I have to wait till then for my reward, so be it. I'm not getting moved off my inheritance to no devil. Like I'm on it. And if I have to wait till later for that reward, but that's Naboth, I'm excited to go to heaven one day and ask Amen. about him because, because of his obedience not to sell the land, it kind of provoked, and ultimately it was Jezebel who, who did it, yeah. but provoked her to take what belonged to the Lord. Mm-hmm. And you know what her fate and Ahab's fate was? And Ahab did repent. It bought him a little bit of time, but that's it. Eventually he died in the same place where they spilled Naboth's blood yeah, and right. said the dogs licked up Jezebel's that's blood. Right. That's right. But Naboth ended that whole dynasty. His obedience, he he watched that from heaven. But I just want to encourage you, when God, when you have paid full price for something, only because you know that your father has ultimately paid full price for it, but he's allowed you to walk along that journey and understand that process, don't let anyone Don't let anyone come take that from you. Don't let anyone sway you from what he's spoken to you. You you hang out and you camp on. You live and die on the word of God. And you'll watch, even if it's in heaven, you'll see those dynasties. They they were two kingdoms, two nations came together with Ahab and Jezebel. Like Elijah was even terrified of them. But this forced their hand. They showed their cards because of Naboth. But they, that ended the dynasty. That, yeah. that took it right out. But if you'll be obedient, and, the, and pro, I guess the last thing I would want to say, and you can help me with this, but the thing we've been camped out on is obedience is yeah, better right. than sacrifice. Yes. Yes. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Like, if you'll just get out of the way, if you'll just do what he tells you to do, you don't have to sing great, you don't have to preach great, you don't have to break, you don't have to figure out the numbers, you don't have to do the census. It, man, just do what he tells you to do. It's that simple. Point up here. Point up here. Just do what he tells you. That's it. Oh, man. That's it. Why don't you guys just stand with us, if you would? We'll see, see what God is going to do here. You know, I, I love the Naboth thing. I, and again, this is what we love about each other. I don't know if she was going to say that, but I love that Naboth did that because it was the right thing. That may sound so simple, but I don't know about you, but I know many people in my life that they do things not because it's the right thing to do. They do it. They do it because they want something. They do it because they want to look better. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, in, in my circle at least, sometimes that tends to happen more in the church than it does in the world. Yeah. But we've got to, this full price thing, David paid full price because it was the right thing to do. He could have easily just taken Ornan's offering. And that, you know what, I bet Ornan would have got blessed because yeah. he served the king. But it wasn't the right thing. So this is what I want to ask you. Just close your eyes. Let's, let's just... 
Let's just sit here for a second. We don't, I don't want to push past this. There's been such an unusual sense and presence of the Lord here today. It, it started when we got in here. It, it was here when we got here. You guys have something, and it's the same thing. I, I recognize it as a kindred spirit to what we're going through. It just There's just something there. We can't really put our finger on it, but we feel it. We know it. We know the Lord is moving. We know the Lord is doing some amazing things. I, I, I've had a word for probably six months now, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to release it on you. I feel like God, we were walking through the campus. My daughter's trying to go to college, and we were walking through a campus that she ended up going to. But it was a Christian campus, and we're walking through, and God just spoke to me instantly. He said, watch what I do. Because in my mind, I'm counting. I'm counting the census. I'm counting the money. I'm counting how are we going to do this, knowing that God's going to do it. But how are we going to be a part of it? And God said, watch what I do. And I feel like God is releasing that. He released it on our church, but I feel like he's releasing it here. Listen, watch what he does. Yes, Jesus. He is really good at this. Yes, he is. He's really good at the impossible. Watch what he does. If you're in an impossible situation, you should be happy. You should thank God that you are there. If you can't do anything about it, guess what? He's getting ready to pour out his spirit. He's getting ready to move. And the outcome will always be better than the outcome that you can produce through your flesh and on your own. Jesus, Father, we love you, God. We, we thank you. God, I thank you for this congregation. You, you can feel, God, they're here because they love you. They're here because they want to worship you. They're here because they're pointing to you. And God, I've seen how you are revolutionizing lives by people who have gone through incredibly difficult situations. But because they leaned into it, you are doing something extraordinary. And I believe you're going to do that for New Bethel Community Church. You're about to do something extraordinary in this place. Isaiah 64 says... Oh, that you would rend the heavens yeah. and that you would come down. Yeah. God, I pray that right now in Jesus' name. Oh, that your presence would rend the heavens and begin to descend on this place, God. Oh God. We need more of you. We are not satisfied with the scraps on the floor, God. We need more of you, Jesus. We may be tired, we may be long-winded, we may be ready to go home, but God, I, I for one, I'm, I'm curious about what you're going to do right now. Jesus. For the terriers, for those who wait, Ooh, God help us to be able to wait again. We are not waiters anymore. We are not terriers anymore. The things that the old church used to cast out, God, we try to counsel them out and then wonder why it's not effective. Lord, reposition us. Help us, God, to be changed in your presence. Yes. God, I pray right now, I pray that you begin to fall. If anybody's familiar with Azusa Street, I pray that you begin to fall as you did at Azusa Street. Yes. Just miracles. And, and no one led those meetings. The leader sat with his head in an apple cream while the lay people stood up and sang hymns and sang songs and shared the word. And when somebody stood up out of turn, no one rebuked them because the Holy Spirit convicted them in that moment and they sat down. Lord, lead our services once again. Whatever price we have to pay, God, let us pay it. Reveal it to us. You're calling your people to walk in freedom. Not just a measure of it, but in fullness of it. God, I pray that today you begin to highlight some of those things. Some of those things, God, where maybe we've been skimping and we've been, we've been taking somebody else's help when you're calling us to offer a full sacrifice by ourselves. Help us to take inventory of our hearts today, God. This is the only census that makes sense. The only census that is godly is taking an inventory of where we are in you. Thank you, Lord. God, minister to these people. Minister to these people, Lord.